The true secret to success in business is not the business plan, it's not reconciling your books, it's none of that. No, it's being delusional. In this episode of Midwest Mindset, we are gonna talk about the true secret to success in business, having a delusional mindset. Hello and welcome back to Midwest Mindset, the podcast that makes marketing simple and easy to do. My name is Matt Tompkins of Two Brothers Creative, where you can make your marketing easy with the easy box. You give us 30 minutes, we give you 30 days of content. I am joined by our producer in the studio, the control room, where he doesn't do anything all day long. He just pretends to work. Myron McHugh, he's Irish, we think. We're not really sure. We can't understand him with the accent. He's a little uh, bit of everything. He's a little bit of everything. He's kind of a mutt, I, I believe is the term. I can't decide if his last name is more of a 80s action hero or villain. Mm. McHugh. 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 So McHugh. Yeah. It's probably like a, a detective. Yeah. He's, a, he's a man who's also had like 10 different nicknames. None of them have stuck. Myred. And people just continue to mispronounce his first name. <laughs> Nobody me. can say his first name. <laughs> Myred it. And you'll say it to him and say, his name's Myred it. Oh, hey, Merton. <laughs> I know. What every just time happened? I practice right. in the mirror in the morning. <laughs> Austin Anderson is here on the couch too, along with Ben Tompkins. Uh, Austin's the new, uh, the newbie, the noob, the the rookie, the rookie card. You need to get yourself the Austin Anderson rookie card. Nope. Uh, it's worth some money not, someday. It's worth some money someday, and that day is not today. Ben <laughs> is a uh, self-proclaimed inventor of the human cat tree. He loves to make <laughs> cat trees where human beings and cats can intimately spend time together. Right. You can learn more at humancattree.org. Like you have never looked right. at a cat tree and thought how how comfortable would that be to crawl no, into that no. little box? I it's all, I just connected the dots. It's all making sense hmm. now. Your Omaha Live sketch where you're a kitty. Oh uh, yeah. Yes, I don't mm -hmm. remember that. That was <laughs> you blacked out. I think for that sketch. That yeah. was you know that was the uh, foreshadowing of, my of cat, human cat tree. Become, yeah, yes. exactly. I was trying to explain foreshadowing to my wife the other night. Didn't go over. Uh, no, it's because um, she gets mad at me whenever we're watching TV shows or movies. I already I'll say out loud of it. Oh, she's gonna die. Oh, it was she did it. And yeah, I did like, the same thing, dude. She's like, How did you know? And I'll go. It's called foreshadowing. And then I had to, I had to mansplain what foreshadowing was, which, as we both know, yeah. by the way, mansplaining is when you explain something to someone else in a condescending tone. You're mansplaining, mansplaining, man. Am I mansplaining, mansplaining? <laughs> so, uh, mansplaining, by the way, as every man knows, goes over very well with women. Oh. Women love to have things mansplained to them. Right. You know, if you um, want to go to bed at night in silence, yes, it's the best. Do way some to mansplaining. Yeah, do some good. mansplaining. Yeah. Yes, that's uh, yeah. Uh, she will no longer talk hmm. to you for that. <laughs> yeah, it'll be a week, and you'll hear her back. Uh, but no, I was trying to explain that to her. I was like, well, it's where this little, little this little nugget was brought here. You know, it's like, oh, the girl had a sliver in her finger, and in uh, War of the Worlds, and she said it'll just push its way out, and that's how you know how the movie's gonna end, right there in that little moment. Right, and you yeah. I just watched yeah. Ghostbusters with my son and I saw some foreshadowing I never mm -hmm. caught before. Mm -hmm. Bill Murray goes to Sigourney Weaver's uh, penthouse for the first time and on her counter is a carton of eggs and a package of Stay Puffed Marshmallows. Yes, Ooh. I remember that little that little drop. Yes, foreshadowing, by the way, nothing to do with foreskin. Totally different topic. We're not yeah. gonna get into that one. No. Which next, is another one. Next I've, episode. I've been watching this show. It's like naked dating where they have a game show where they all start off naked and you just see their naked bodies slowly. It starts at the waist down and then the waist and the up and then like you eliminate people purely based on looks. Now purely based on looks. <laughs> It is the most fantastic reality show I've ever seen. It's a some in the UK. I mean, it was. I, it's on HBO Max. Is it now. French? It sounds. Oh like my god! France, it's yeah. just like the variety of penises that you're exposed to. It's uh, it's educational, really. But I didn't realize like the foreskin <laughs> was as popular as it is throughout the planet. I, oh know, yeah, I think we're like in the minority there. Yeah, we're kind of in the minority there. I'd be like, you know. But you know. Uh, anyhow, uh, let's get to marketing and business because <laughs> we can't talk about foreskins all day long. Yeah, we, I mean, we you know could, what we're sounding yeah. like. We're sounding pretty delusional. <laughs> Don't be the foreskin right of your segue, business. Ben. Yeah. Good segue. Yes. Okay. So here is the true secret to, to success in business because everybody's searching for this and there's all oh, how many clickbait articles are there out there? They're like, this is the secret. There's a Michael J. Box Fox got in on this madness with the secret to my success. Remember that movie in the 80s? It was a terrible movie. It was a terrible oh, movie. Yeah. He slept with his aunt. The secret to success in business is 
there, well, there, there are a lot of things that factor into like being successful in business. Mo most of it is like the boring shit. It's all the things you don't want to do that business owners put off, like, you know, taxes and paying bills and, you know, not racking up credit card debt. It's just all these things. You're, you're reconciling your books and having processes and procedures. A lot of things we've talked about on this podcast. All those things, yes, they're very important. You need to do those things. But if I had to pick one thing that is the true, like, secret defining difference that I have seen and noticed between successful entrepreneurs and business owners and those who, who don't make it all the way um, would be having a delusional mindset. And what does that mean? Okay, so, all right. 51% of all businesses go out of business in the first three to five years, all right? By the way, we just celebrated our three-year anniversary here at Two hey. Brothers Creative, so nice. we are almost out of the window there. Only a couple more years of this to go, boys, and we'll be in the <laughs> top 49%. Then we can go out of business our sixth year and yes. set a whole new Oh, uh, We're gonna statistic. be in a category of one. Um, only 6% of all businesses in the United States ever reach a million dollars that's wild to me, by the yeah, way. When that's you, crazy. Yeah, when you first told me that, I was like, that is mm -hmm. nuts. I mean, I, I don't, so low. I don't know the percentage, but it's a crazy percentage. It's like 60, 70, or 80% of all businesses are solopreneur, where it's just one person yeah, in the United mm -hmm. States. Like, you know, it, it's kind of wild to look at those statistics. But you look at these numbers, like, as a business owner, you kind of have to be a little bit delusional to get into business in the first place because, you know, we don't know those statistics when we get into it. Right. But we start to feel it right away. We start to feel the pinch. We're like, oh, my God, like this is tough. You know, yeah. like uh, anybody who's like gotten into real estate. That's a perfect, a perfect example. So real estate, they, they get their real estate license or a realtor. Now, I'm going to go out and make a million dollars a year. It's going to be easy. It's going to sell some homes. Can use my charm, my wit, my good looks and my good smells. Mm. Mm, yes. <laughs> and uh, what we don't realize, though, is the average age, the average age re for the, the age for the average real estate age in the United States, 60 years old, six oh, zero. Yeah. The average income under seventeen thousand dollars a year. That is the average income. So when we get into any business, even if it's like a solopreneur venture, we're slapped in the face. That that, really, that's a good I, and it's like you there. don't want to know like, those. Did you like that slap? That was a, <laughs> yeah. It was not a very good one. Here, I'll, for the people listening on audio only, they'll have the, the sure. slap. Um, but yeah, like the, the the we find out really quick how hard it is to run a, a business that's in business, let alone profitable, let alone successful, let alone million dollars in revenue successful. So you have to be delusional to a degree. But what I'm talking about is in that path, in that journey, there are things that will happen. There, that are these like gut blows, these just massive blows that any average person, if they were dealt one of these blows, they would be curled up in the corner of the shoe department at Kohl's, crying and crying and would not leave for at least a couple days. And they would say, forget this, I'm out, man. This is dumb. I'm gonna go back to my job at Kohl's. I live I at love Kohl's the shoe now. department. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh. I used to work in the shoe department at Kohl's too. Did you? Uh, yeah, overnights, <laughs> yeah, baby. Um, but you have to be able to absorb these blows, keep calm and carry on, as they say, right? And then focus on what you know you need to get done. Now, you, when I say delusional, like sometimes we're delusional, we don't ignore all the things, okay, we ignore too many things. And I go, well, maybe you should pay attention to the taxes or the different things you aren't doing. Um, anything that can result in prison time. <laughs> yes, <laughs> don't do anything illegal, at least not yet. Um, but you have to have this kind of, it's a, the ability to compartmentalize things is what I'm talking about. You have to be able to compartmentalize. So like, I had a week recently uh, where it was like, okay, it was, this was a sequence of real things that happened. Got, found out, I was told, you're gonna have, you owe $90,000 in taxes by the end of the year, which was not expecting. Turns out it was like a clerical error thing. Uh, learned we were gonna have to pay instead of $17,000. Wait, wait, how many days did you have to go before hmm. you knew it was an error? I just found out like it was like for over a month, five or six weeks now. So you had to you that oh, was, I was on your shoulders but, for it till you found yeah, out. Oh yeah, yeah, it's been this whole time. That, yeah. So like, I found out, hey, you're gonna pay ninety thousand dollars in taxes that you didn't expect. Um, the seventeen thousand dollar payment is actually sixty seven thousand dollars you're gonna have to pay us for this other thing. Um, you know, and then you have swings like most business owners do. We're gonna have that natural turn with clients where it's just nothing you can control. It just happens, and so you might have a month where you have like a ten or twelve thousand dollar swing in a matter of a few days, it's like all of a sudden, poof. And so get, you get dealt with these blows, like literally by the end of the week, I was like talking about it and people would look at me like, well, are you okay? Cause that really sounds like a rough week. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm good. Like, I mean, at some point you just kind of kind of laugh at it cause it's ridiculous. 
You know, it's yeah. these numbers well, are so ridiculous. Think, yeah, there's a level of delusion, but then also a level of ignorance that's mixed in that. Yeah, too. that's what I was thinking. I'm like, talking about willful delusion, not ignorance. The, like, well, the, to get started, like being ignorant be of those ignorant. numbers, like six percent mm -hmm. only make it. Yeah. yeah, you know, like those, like not knowing that stuff before you jump into business, I think yeah, not is good because then you'd be yeah, like, why would I even try? Why yeah, even yeah. Bother? And I think in our history, when the other you know ventures that we've gone through with like playing in a band and you doing stand up, I mean, you have a a big sense of ignorance. Not that you're choosing to ignore, but you just are entering this field and you don't know anything about it, and you're just going kind of blindly. Is ignorance is bliss until you figure it out. But if you had known everything that you know now. Uh, maybe not because the company's gotten to be pretty successful, but all of the turmoil that you've gone through when you first started the company, and that would probably push a lot of people away yeah. um, mm -hmm. right off the bat. So you have to be, have this sense of ignorance to a you degree do. starting out, yeah. which I would I would classify underneath that umbrella of delusion. And like, yeah, I'm talking about like, it's like almost like an optimism, optimism versus pessimism. Like you have to be a, like a real realistic optimist or whatever the, the term is. Like you have to have, you can't ignore reality, you know? And like, I we this Two Brothers Creative the first time around when we were doing the TV show Omaha Live, like I didn't even know what an entrepreneur was, let alone that I, I was one. I still don't know how to spell it. It's a hard word, entrepreneurialship. Yeah. Why is that even a word? We have entrepreneurial, entrepreneurialism, entrepreneurialship. They just keep adding things. They just keep it. adding it's words. More vowels. I, it's <laughs> dumb. You know, entrepreneurs are struggling with just entrepreneur, let alone all these other extra words, but, or letters, but, Entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur, I didn't know what it was. I remember the first year I didn't pay any taxes, I didn't, or I didn't take, I didn't keep track of anything with my books, and I had to pay like seven. We had to take out a loan, like a line of credit on the house, to pay this like twenty-seven thousand dollar tax bill. I just didn't have a clue. I didn't even know that was a thing. You know, I'm like getting, and so you learn a lot of these lessons really quick. And like the first time around, that was probably two and a half, three years of doing that. Um, it wasn't like we went out of business because we were really just doing a. We had a few clients and um, that we were doing video production for and then the television show was the main driver we were doing. Television show did not pay dick. I mean, it paid $500 per episode. Gross. Dude, and not- taxes. For and a weekly 30 minute television show. The amount show. of work so that much work. you put into that. Yeah, so much work. Is um, but mind blowing. You're right, like the first time around, like oh, so much learning experience. Looking back now, I mean, A, we learned how to produce a high quality show on a freaking shoestring, non-existent budget, yeah. which we now translate to how we help clients because you know we're gonna charge them a much more fair rate than what you're gonna see at any other marketing agency, production, content creation. So that was a huge learning curve. Learning how to lead and motivate teams because we had, by the end of the seventh season, we had 24 total people volunteering their time every week, the equivalent to each of them having a 15 to 20 hour part-time job. Yeah, and they were not getting paid, and it was just so you had to learn ways. Like, how do we get people invested in this idea so that it's a team effort? You know, how do you reward? How do you incentivize when you don't have money? And, and you learn that money it, isn't even the big incentivizer. It what really did you isn't. do in that mm -hmm. in that case? Because so I, I think that's I, a good example. So a, I started by always proving I'm willing to do everything I'm asking you to do. So I'm going to show up every time we shoot. I'm going to help tear down sets, break down lights. I'm never going to be like when we played in a band. I'm probably the only lead singer of any band that ever existed that actually did most of the, I would go pick up the trailer, then go pick up the, the sound equipment, then pick up our bass player. You didn't have a car to drive. Yeah, you were your own then roadie. I, yeah, then I would drive home. We would load up all the gear. I would be the one leading the setup of all the equipment. Then we'd do a four hour gig and then we'd have a four hour takedown and tear down of all the equipment. And then we'd drive back. It was just, so I, would be like, all right, I'm gonna do this. And that's why it's important when you started a band to be delusional. Yes. Because oh, you God, did yes. not know no. that you were gonna be doing that after playing mm. a show and then have to do all that work. You know, that's that's you're up all night. Oh, it's it's relentless. Like and you're young, you're drinking. Like, oh. I don't know how we did it. Because I mean I have like a beer and I'm hungover for two days now. Yeah. I don't know how we did that back in the day. I mean, Ben had so many women coming after him as the drummer. So many. They were still uh, coming after they're him. They're still coming after him. <laughs> There's, a, there's, a, there's a lady in Grand Island. She knows she's the leopard lady. Remember her? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, the, <laughs> the leopard, leopard lady? She used to go around interviewing 80s tribute bands. And this is in like the early, two th late 2000s. And she was on to, first our bass player, then Ben. And she was, she was relentless. Like, you're going to sleep with me. And she's like, 
30 years older than us. I mean, I did not yeah. remotely she wore leopard pants. And she wore leopard pants everywhere she went. She was a leopard lady. That, that yeah. was her, you know, that's an example of her modifying her business strategy. It was probably main bands, and then she I'm just, doing, yeah. I'm just going to target tribute bands. tribute bands from now on. I'm going to target bass players of tribute bands. That's she my found niche. her niche. And then, and then you went after the bass player. She's like, nope, she had to make the pivot. Made a pivot. All right, I'm to going me. after bass players and niche and, and tribute drummers. bands. Yeah. Uh, Looking at the statistics, who gets so, asked less to get laid? <laughs> oh, it's the bass player. It's not working. Um, so you have to have a this like, it's it, your eyes on this dream. Like you're a dreamer. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business owner, you're a dreamer. I think everybody's a dreamer. I think everybody, I mean, nobody out there. I think a true delusional like sociopath in like the scary way uh, is, is, is a non-dreamer. Like, I mean, right. everybody has a dream, right? Everybody has a good idea. And I think really it's just, it's can you, uh, can you compartmentalize all these different things? And then can you go through really challenging, horrible experiences, let's be honest. Like the TV show is like, we nearly ruined my marriage. <laughs> By the end of the show, the last episode, I mean, we, it was like at this like, okay, we're at a crossing point. Like this is like how many hours do you think you put on a week, in a week, uh, week on average? Well, I mean, we edited the TV show at night, so thirty minute show. So you had, uh, I mean, I would have forty two hour straight editing marathons at least once a week. Where I would just I edit. It. I mean, I was doing a lot of drugs at the time, so that's why that's why that's not quite as impressive as it sounds. I mean, it, it was bad, but no, that's how I would like maintain yeah. that. And then, so yeah, I was going through a severe opiate addiction at the time of doing that, which was taxing. I don't even know how I survived that because I did that whole show at maybe like 30, 40 percent capacity. That yeah. entire most of that show, because just because when drugs like you're going through the withdrawals and you're on, you're off, and it's just like so, it's so taxing on your body. Like I was nowhere close to 100 percent as, as a person. So yeah, it was. I would say probably 80 to 90 hours a week. Because I mean, we would film like all day Saturday, all day Sunday, sometimes during the week. Um, and then there was two, like the last season of the show. Like and then you also, had writers groups. Yeah, you had that. And for well, for half, for three of the. Yeah, two and a half of those years, I was also hosting radio shows for three hours during the day, Monday through Friday. Yeah. I did a news talk show, and then I was doing mornings on Sweet 98.5 So for the last season. So I don't know how I did it. You know, I mean, having that team, I think, is crucial. It was, you know, it started off as just literally me and Ben and our cousin, Adam, with just like some one camera, four lights, and that was all we had. Basement of our dad's church. And then you build out from there. You grow from there. And so I think you have to be able to learn. You have to be delusional in a in a constructive way, right? You have to keep your eye on the dream and be like, yeah, I know this looks impossible. I know people are gonna tell me I'm crazy, but I'm just gonna keep pushing forward, which is what people told us. They were like, you can't do a show for 500 bucks a week. You're not gonna be getting any ratings. And you know, it didn't be the number one rated show yeah. in this time slot. And ended up, everybody thought the television station produced it and they had nothing to do with the production. We did it literally out of our basement. So I think you have to have that, but you also, you have to learn through those failures and setbacks and then apply them to the to the next leg, the next venture, which is what we did here with the com the the uh, the version of our company here today, is applying all these things and lessons that we've learned over the years to today. But I think no matter what stage of success or where your business is at, you're always going to have these setbacks, these blows that seem devastating, and some people can take them on and compartmentalize them in a healthy way and be like, okay. I can't do anything about a $90,000 tax bill today. I don't think I ever could do anything about a $90,000 tax bill. <laughs> just run I'm like Wesley gonna, Snipes, dude. And then you have two <laughs> options. Like I can compartmentalize it, and I can just pretend like it doesn't exist forever, yeah. and it turns into a big problem, problem that turns you into that statistic of 51% that go out of business. That's not the answer. Or you can compartmentalize it in a healthy way, and that's what we're talking about here today, and I think that's the key takeaway here is, compartmentalize things in a healthy way where it's like, I'm not going to let this derail me from my focus of where I need to be paying attention. Because if you look at it and you play this game of a, a, a having a, um, a scarcity mindset where it's just, oh God, I have, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna have a $90,000 tax bill? I don't know how to tax bill, I can't. Well, and then you think, well, I needed to hire this new person to expand. I can't hire a new person if I've got a $90,000 tax bill, and then, well, then you can't expand. And then you lose this business opportunity, and then it's gonna have this compounding effect. And so if you, you have to be able to compartmentalize it, not forever, to deal with it later accordingly, because you can't control these events. They're gonna happen. They're gonna get thin. That's why that week I just laughed. I'm like, 
This is ridiculous. Quite maniacally, like, I just heard this very scary laughter coming out of Matt's office. <laughs> for was. A number like, of well, minutes. Ah, 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 that's like, what that was. Is that's he what that crying? Was. Is he laughing? I'll come back later. It's, it's a, a combination. It's a combination. It's a combination. It was a laugh crack. You know, when you were talking earlier about dreams, you know, these people that have uh, everyone dreams, and then uh, one component is taking action on that dream. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to someone that, you know, has all these dreams, they talk about their dreams, we've all know these yeah. people, but they've never ever took that first step, mm -hmm. that first just putting it into action. This is a great, this is great. And I told this to my dog the other night and when I was talking to them. <laughs> You're gonna notice the theme, I talked to my dog tonight. There is There are people that say, this is a billion dollar company. This is a billion dollar idea. This is a million dollar company. This is the idea. There's no such thing. Until you have a billion dollar offer, until you have a million dollar offer, it is not worth anything. If you have a great idea, that's awesome. But guess what? Everybody on this planet has a great idea. Literally everybody on this planet has a great idea. Ben and I came up with celebrity farts in a bag 15 years ago. Yeah. And it became a thing. Everybody laughed at us at the time. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. What does Brad Pitt's <laughs> yes. fart smell like? Pff, ooh, it's like potpourri. But no. Uh, but celebrity farts in a bag aside. I think like wood chips and musk. Right. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> exactly like, what Brad like Pitt's Missouri. farts smell like. Thank you. Yes. Um, so everybody has a great idea. The difference is, are you willing to actually fucking do it? Are you willing to actually step up onto that stage in front of that crowd? Are you willing to take out that loan for your business? Are you willing to actually share your idea with somebody else in the first place? A lot of people have these great ideas. We leave them up here and we don't even, we don't even verbalize them. We just, ter we're terrified right. of the result. You or even what to... people will say to you about it. Yes. Yeah. You know? Yep. So, I mean, what would you say to someone that is just so worried about what people think they don't want to do their idea because they don't want anyone to say something bad about it? Then I would say for them, don't start a business because yeah. you're not ready. You know? I think, I think there are these key fundamental qualities like that compartmentalizing is one we're talking about today. Um, but I think, you know, having the ability to have this, I don't know, this like, I don't give a shit attitude, right? You care more than anything, but you kind of have to not care about anything. Yeah, you know? that is true. And you have to like step up and be like, I'm willing to like put myself out there. And I think that's part of like us growing up, you know, Ben and I grew up with in theater, musicals, and we had a lot of performance growing up. And so being on the radio, when I got to the radio, I remember showing up and I was like, I never saw it as being on a big stage in front of tens of thousands of people. I was like, I was me and these two people in a room. We're just trying to make each other laugh. Okay, that's easy. Let's do this. Yeah. You know. And so I think you have to have that kind of delusional mindset. Sometimes it comes easier than for some people than others, but you have to embrace it and you have to know which which choice you're going to make, right? Because the stakes are, you compartmentalize it. You know, if you don't compartmentalize it and you just let it overwhelm you, it's going to destroy you in real time. Yeah. If you compartmentalize it and you don't deal with it in a constructive, healthy way, it's going to slow you, destroy you over time. But the other option is you you make the choice to compartmentalize it, apply it to what you're doing, face it head on, and that's where you win, you know? But it is a skill set, just being able to take the blows and not let them For real. turn you into a freaking wet blanket on the, on the ground. I think it comes with uh, age and time, too. It does. Being Wisdom, able to, oh, yeah. be like, you know, taking, because when you first take blows, you're like, you yeah. do want to sleep in a uh, cold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, know what? Department. <laughs> you know what it is, like what you're talking about. So I've, I have this theory. Everybody <laughs> has a crucible in their life they go through. And a crucible is like, yeah. a crucible is like an extreme test. I think in the definition, it's like an extreme test of like fire and steel. Like they get graphic with this description of this test. The dark night of the soul is yes. what I've heard they call it. And so, yeah. like in, I, in a movie. I talk about that. No. I, uh, bef when I went through my addiction and hit the lowest lows you can get, like literally praying to die, just be killed because it was just torture. Yeah. Um, I look back at that now as, the, as a blessing. You know, it's like that is the that was the best thing that could have happened to me because that was my crucible and coming out the other side of it, it gave me all this like perspective and wisdom and things I didn't really 
have before. Like I didn't have an understanding of, of grace for other people or myself. I didn't have, I wasn't able to empathize with people in situations and think, okay, well, I've been through something, not the same thing, but maybe I should be open to understanding this, you know? Um, understanding, appreciating what you have and what you're working towards and that the risks are worth, or the rewards are worth the risks, you know? So I would not have been able to host radio shows, a talk show for three hours a day, after, if not, you know, because that was right when I got, I, I decided to get sober and clean in 2016. Oh, yeah. And start a news talk show of all years to try and stay sober in news talk radio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. Oh, yeah. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. That was a, that was a, but I made it through. And it's like, I, but I look back at that as like, that's a blessing. You're not know saying it's like all shits and giggles, and, giggles and now, you, but like, it's tough. It. It's just, it's always a challenge, but right. you're right. Like, it's not even an age thing. It's just the wisdom of going through these crucibles and these challenges that define you. Like that is truly where you discover who you are. And if you're cut, if you're cut from the yeah. cloth to do this. Because you can look back on that and go, I got through this insane addiction. Like I can get through anything basically. Because mm -hmm. right. that's extreme. Yeah. So if you can make it through that, then you know, other things that come your way in business or life in general, you're like, all right, I, you can look back at those past uh, wins, you know, whether small or big and be like, I can, I can do this. I mean, if I can go from mainlining cocaine in the bathroom of a Casey's general store to where we are today, I think anything is possible. Or now you're at a quick trip moving yeah. on up. These days I'm in a quick trip because yeah. this is Casey's. You've only hit rock down. bottom if you go to Mega Mart. What <laughs> has happened to Casey's? That's a topic for another episode. Oh God! Oh I my won't. God! I don't know, but the original Casey's are doing. Dude. They're still solid, but all the new ones. What the fuck? Like, I actually before they built a new Casey's in Wahoo because I lived in Wahoo for a while. They had an older one, and I actually got them a new roof because no one they wouldn't fix it every time it rained it poured oh, inside God. they had buckets everywhere and i just and i like the ladies like the people that work there i'm like i'm gonna get you a new roof so i would call corporate and i'd be like i can't believe you treat your employees like this you don't even fix the roof i'd send pictures and then it took about two weeks and they came out and nice. put a new roof on yeah there you go well good job austin, austin thanks man. we're ending this episode on a high note yeah. <laughs> guess what i'd go in there they would give me free pizza really yeah nice. yes. ladies and their pizza's not bad yeah yeah it's yeah. not bad not too shabby thanks for joining us here today on midwest mindset if you want to make your marketing easy there is no easier solution than the easy box it's as simple as this you give us 30 minutes, we give you 30 days of content, and we'll post it for you on all your socials. All your, all the socials. You know the socials, where your kids are, and you're afraid to go because of what your grandma might say. My grandma thinks she's sending a message to someone. She's just pub posting things. I think my uncle got on there, and he thought he was asking Google a question. He was really just on Facebook. It's, all, <laughs> it's always just kind of a gamble. What's going to happen? But if you want to promote and grow your business, you need content. You need it out there on a daily basis. Quality content that reflects you and your unique perspective, experience, and success. And that's what the Easy Box does. We take it all off your plate for you. 30 minutes, 30 days of content. Get started now. The link is in the show notes. You can click on the link, I'm told, with your fingers or Ben. Any other body part. Any other body part and once you get that elon musk brain chip you just think about it yes mm -hmm. if you don't die from it pretty soon well let's hope that doesn't happen